I can start Edgar by saying how much I enjoyed the movie. I thought it was absolutely just brilliant because I mean my parents are huge Sparks fans, so my uh, so I've always they've always been in my life. But it was, it was the first time I've really dug deep, so to speak, into them. So it was a a great odyssey into their work. Um, but what what inspired uh, this idea to to make a movie of Sparks? Had it had it been something that you've been thinking about for for some time? In a roundabout way, but not necessarily thinking that I would do it. I I. I was a fan and I'd become more and more of a fan with each passing year. So I think they're one of those bands that like, it's not just that their albums in the seventies are amazing. What was somehow even more impressive is that all of the recent albums are really good. And I, I certainly in this century sort of had this growing admiration for like the fact that Ron Russell were like keeping going and sort of seemingly flying in the face of the trajectory of any other band who've been going for that long by making like albums that were getting consistently good, but getting like more ambitious. And it was really sort of amazing to, to witness. So I, I still become like coming, going from a fan to being like a full on evangelist that anybody within my earshot, I would say, hey, did you ever listen to Sparks? Or be trying to turn people on to Sparks like you do when you're a fan of a band. And then I'd start to say to friends of mine who were like sort of, you know, kind of, um, open to Sparks, like I'd say, hey, so why hasn't somebody made a documentary about Sparks? Or Sparks would be such a great music documentary. And like, wow, what are the, you know, why hasn't somebody done a documentary about them? They're so much more prolific than a lot of other bands and so much more influential. So I just kept kind of saying it out loud. And then it was actually a Sparks gig in 2017 that I was there with Phil Lord and uh, who also liked the band. And when I said to him, somebody should make a documentary about Sparks, he said, you should make a documentary about Sparks. So he was the one who kind of finally like put it out there. And I was like, yeah, I will. So I pitched it to Ron Russell after the gig. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, do you remember the, the, your first kind of meeting with the brothers? And did, did they need sort of any convincing to, for you to make this, this, this film about them? Well, it's two separate things. I'd met them two years previously. So in 2015, around the time that the FFS album came out, the one with Franz Ferdinand, I uh, had been listening to a ton of Sparks as usual. And I was, it was when I was writing Baby Driver, in fact, in Los Angeles. And I was sitting in the office with my friend, Michael Bacall, the screenwriter, <coughs> who was helping me out that day. And he, um, we were talking about Sparks and I was playing a lot of Sparks and it just led me to say, well, I wonder if Sparks are on Twitter. And I found their profile page and it said, Sparks follows you. So number one, I was kind of ashamed that I wasn't already following them. And maybe because I assumed they were too cool to be on Twitter. So I followed them back. I messaged them and said, is this really the band? Like, because sometimes, a, you know, a publicity person might run the account. I said, is this really the band? Because I'm such a huge fan. And Russell, the lead singer, replied and said, yeah, this is Russell. We're big fans of your movies. And I was like, well... Uh, this is amazing. And he said, where are you based? I said, well, I'm currently in Los Angeles. And they said, well, we live in Los Angeles. And I said, maybe we should meet up. And, I, and then within 32 hours, I was at Russell's house having breakfast with him and Ron. And, um, and that was amazing because, you know, we talked about the band and we talked about my films and what I was doing. And even back then they talked about that they might be doing a musical with Leos Carrick's called Annette. Like, it was like, as far back as that, it was like a thing that may or may not be happening. So it was sort of amazing in a way that like a lot of things talked about kind of all came together, but I, I guess that was the start of it. I want to talk as well about Julia Marcus, your resident super fan, uh, because she's my auntie. <laughs> no way! Yeah. <laughs> um, oh. yeah. So, because I, I gather she wrote a letter and that's how you came to be aware of her. Well, what made you want to include Julia? I mean, obviously, other than the fact she's amazing, because it is actually quite rare in documentaries, particularly music documentaries, to have a kind of fan perspective. Well, number one, before we talk about your auntie, <laughs> uh, it was important to sort of for me to have an equivalent between just people who are fans of the band and famous people who are fans of the band. And they're all shot in the same way in the documentary. We shoot them all the same. So it was important for me to shoot Julia the same way that we would shoot Duran Duran. It's like everybody's opinion on Sparks counts. There's an equivalence between like sort of 
non-celebrity fans and celebrity fans. And what happened was, is that early on in the process, we put out the word on my social media and Spark social media to say, we're making a documentary. Do you have any photos, videos, mementos, or stories about Sparks? And our archive producer, Kate Griffiths, said that it was like the biggest response she'd ever had to a request like that. And Julia, your auntie, was one of the people who emailed. And George Henkin, my producer, showed me her email. And I sort of read the email, which was her kind of anecdote of her account of stage invading in 1975, when she was 14, I think, yeah. 13 or 14. And it was such an amazingly written anecdote. I said to George, I said, we should just get her to say this on camera. I mean, you don't really know whether people are actually going to be comfortable being on camera, but she was brilliant. And she was an amazing interview. And I was, it's one of my favorite bits. Tell your auntie. <laughs> it's one of my favorite bits in the documentary because cutting between like her and the footage and her watching the footage and even cutting to the roadie, Richard Coble, who's the person who pulls her off who now is like the Rolling Stones tour manager. That Sparks tour was the first tour that he ever rode in. And now he's like one of the top sort of tour managers in the, in the world. So yeah, that was uh, just really special to me to be able to kind of cut together that footage with, you know, all of these amazing sort of um, corroborating accounts. And like your auntie's amazing. In fact, on the Blu-ray, there's like extra stuff, like, cause there was so much footage. And uh, there's a bit more from her on the uh, book. But listen, tell her, tell her she's in the deleted scenes as well. Oh, well, yeah, well, she's she's watching it. She's seeing it tonight. I think and you're, the thing you're doing a Q&A for tonight. She'll oh, be really? Right. Tonight. She's going to be there. Yeah, well, she's, she's gonna... seen it already. Or she's seen it, right? I don't think she, I'm not sure if she's seen it. No, I think that might be the first right. time on the big screen for the first time, at least. Well, so, yeah. tell her I said hello. She did a great job. Yeah, I will do. Um, I was going to ask as well, I mean, Perhaps sort of similarly to a band like The Fool, maybe there's a kind of underground appreciation of Sparks, a really committed fan base and a big fan base. Yet there's still not necessarily a band that the regular person on the street will have kind of heard about. Uh, but in some ways, that's kind of part of their allure. Was that something you had to kind of wrestle with? Because I guess in some ways, this is make putting them in a kind of mainstream endeavor. So in some ways, not de it's not demystifying them, but it was yeah. I just about that kind of idea. I mean, it's a strange one with Sparks because I mean, in 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 you know, like sort of they did have hits but they they were sort of sporadic and also in different territories at different times so that's one of the things that's kind of like unusual about them is like they had like top 10 hits in the mid 70s and late 70s they had like a number one in like france in 1980 they had like a massive hit in in uh, in the mid 90s in germany they had some hits in la in the early 80s but not until I guess, I think with the, the advent of the internet and people around the world starting to kind of understand that there are like Sparks fans all over, I think maybe that there's kind of more of a, you know, kind of the fan base is more of an equilibrium in terms of it's like a global following. But um, yeah, like there's a feeling, are they like a secret handshake band? Maybe like that might have even been the way that I figured out who might be people to be in the documentary is there are some people that are in the documentary that I just assumed might be Sparks fans <laughs> and I was usually right mm -hmm. like they weren't people that were necessarily had gone on record talking about Sparks but I correctly deduced just by just by having a, a having a, a, a you know like a gut feeling about it that Neil Gaiman, Mike Myers, Fred Armisen, Beck like thinking you like Sparks right oh I love Sparks you know so that was one of the ways that I got people to be in the documentaries. I guess that they were Sparks fans. Um, that said, so there is that thing within the fan base. I understand is like there's a thing where it's like it's it's our band and we don't want it to get bigger because, you know, this is our little secret. But on the flip side, I have heard like, you know, kind of Ron and Russell say it, with the idea of being a cult band, their, their, their response to it is, new customers always welcome <laughs> and in fact my favorite quote in the whole movie mm. is uh, right at the very end is the the uh, gary stewart from rhino records sadly the late gary stewart who's since passed away he says my favorite thing in the whole documentary is he says at the end and this is something you could say about films and about music about any art where like people are sort of quite possessive of it he says um i don't feel any ownership of them i feel like it's really important that 
if people come along 20 or 40 years later, not to say, oh, hey, I was here all the time. Where were you? You say, welcome aboard and here's more. And it's my favorite quote in the whole documentary. And maybe because Gary's no longer with us, it makes me quite emotional when they, whenever he says it. But it's also something I really believe. I feel exactly the same way about films. It's like, you know, if people kind of say, oh, no, this, this cult film is my film and I don't want more people to know about it. It's like, have you asked the makers of the film about that? <laughs> Do you think they would feel the same? Because I think as far as Sparks are concerned, it's like they're very proud of their following. It's not like they... But, you know, they're not going to say no to more people listening to the records. That's crazy. I, I quite like the idea of just playing this game, Guess the Sparks fan. It sounds like you're quite good at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd say four out of five times I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was going to, I mean, I, do you think, because there's one bit I quite enjoyed it, as well in the documentary, is sort of how they're kind of unfairly written off in some sort of areas as being kind of novelty. Do you think there's a place for comedy in music without it veering into being a novelty act? Because I mean, I was listening just last night, I was listening to Up the Junction by Squeeze on my way home from a job. And even that could be. I love that seen, yeah, I mean, that could be perceived as being a kind of novelty song because it's got a kind of jangly kind of like melody to it and the lyrics are quite funny at times. But there is a place, isn't there, for, for, for music to be comedic and without it veering into being some sort of silly novelty act? Yeah, I think what where people get it wrong, and I think that's maybe something with Sparks as we cover in the documentary that like, OK, what's holding them back from being as big as Queen? Part of it is that maybe like a more mainstream listener who might just want to sort of enjoy something completely at face value like you know the sparks are a little bit too much to kind of like think about it's like it requires some unpacking or like to get the full effect of it beyond just the music and the catchiness is actually to sort of you know there's more levels to it but I think there is that thing that sort of like comedy sometimes in music people misread as uh, being insincere that somehow like that they're that, that it's kind of like that because it's a joke that like it's kind of there's something cynical about it and that that's not true and I guess in the same way that kind of in the way that like comedy films are like not held even though they're hugely popular they're not held in the same regard as dramas come like awards time and I don't know why that is it doesn't really make any sense to me like because if it, and, and I think sort of like sparks to me prove that like wit can exist in rock and to be honest like that's the reason that we're still talking about them 50 years later is because there's plenty of bands that started at the same time as sparks who were like much more successful but there's literally nothing else to talk about whereas with sparks there's like tons to unpack and that in itself is really fun yeah, I was, I was going to say as well, I mean, I, one of the things I sort of just took from this is just also just how incredibly hard working and committed to their craft they are. What a, a phenomenal kind of double act those brothers are. But my final question, because um, I, I was sort of talking of kind of um, people that are kind of like enigmas and almost like mystical kind of creatives. You're working with Anya Taylor-Joy <laughs> in Last Night in, in Soho as well, who I, I think she's like a, an alien. I, I believe there's aliens walking amongst us. I think Tom York's an alien, Andre 3000's an alien. And I think she she's in that kind of bracket um, and I mean that as a compliment, but what, what was it like collaborating with her on that project? And you must be quite excited about that soon kind of being out there and being being seen by audiences. Um, it's a difficult one to ask. I mean, it's funny, sort of, I, I, you know, I've known her since she was, whenever The Witch came out, however old she was when that came out, like 17, like sort of, um, so, it, it, in a strange way, it's not like I knew her before she was famous, but I did like meet her very quickly after The Witch and it, and it actually sort of like gravitated because I already had the idea for the movie. I knew that she was the right person to be in it. Strangely enough, actually, I had written the part that Thomas and Mackenzie now plays initially for Anya. And then by the time I'd actually was ready to go with the script and I'd seen Anya in a bunch of other movies, I started to switch and think, you know what, she should play the other part. And luckily she felt the same way, which was great because I'd been talking up this other part to her for about five years, <laughs> so, or maybe four years. So um, uh, like, I, I don't really know how to answer that question because I've sort of only known Anya on planet Earth, but I can see how she's like, sort of definitely feels like sort of, She's got a very otherworldly presence about her, which is why she's an amazing star. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. So, and fact, yeah, and I'll, I'll make sure just I'm going to go and uh, text Julia now and tell her you said hello <laughs> as well.
Listen, my my next two, put it this way, my next two movies, one stars Annie Taylor Joy and the other one stars your auntie. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and of course you did a great job. But thank you so much for your time today, Edgar. It's always a pleasure speaking to you and best of luck with the release and everything you've got coming up. Send my love to Julia. Yeah, I will do. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys.